You're listening to Dark City Radio Live, and this is your host Dawn from the Dark City Crew. Tune in at www.darkcityradio.com. You can find us by searching Dark City Radio on Facebook or Twitter. Welcome to Dawn's Diorama. It's Sunday, April 28th, and this week on the show, I'm joined by Max Bliss, who's a came trail and harp activist and researcher. Max travels around with um, a lot of like-minded folks um, on his campaign of activism uh, against the chemtrails um, with his chug-a-boom van. They, he spreads awareness of the dangers of chemtrails and um, Max can be found under Mr Max Bliss on YouTube, Facebook and on WordPress. So he's all over the place, basically. So Max is joining me to discuss, as I've just mentioned, chemtrails and also we'll be touching on HARP as well and how they relate to each other. And he'll be talking about the work he and others have been doing to expose and stand against this practice. Um, Max, welcome to the show. How are you this evening? Hi, Dawn. Um, thanks for having me. I'm fine, thank you. Thanks for coming on. Um, so can we start maybe just by going back to the beginning, as we usually do? I like to ask my guests like, a little about yourself, and because I'm interested in your background and what happened that led you to getting involved, in particular with the research of chemtrails and HARP. Um, well, um to give you, I suppose, a little, uh, in a nutshell, my life, um, I left school very early and I joined the army for a couple of years and then I decided, uh, through my experiences, to go AWOL for six years. But whilst I was in the army, I did have attend a lecture about the woodpecker, which is um, a similar technology to HARP, which is a device that is used for mind control. Um, so that was my first understanding about stuff that was going on. But then I, I left all that. Um, about 10 years later, no, no, 10 years ago, I was working for an author who was a researcher into HARP. And so I got uh, given a book from her and I did learn a little bit more about it. But then I kind of left it and carried on my life. And I've been working as a builder um, for 20, 20 years, I suppose. And basically outside, weather dependent, always been aware of what's going on in the environment always been interested in nature, always enjoyed being outside. And um, I started to notice chemtrails, which, um, strangely enough, I really only noticed them uh, last year, if I'm honest. Um, uh, so about one year ago was uh, the time I realized that something strange was going on in the sky, and I hadn't seen this before. Now, when I was a lad growing up, I grew up in Brighton, which is only 25 miles from one of the busiest airports in the UK so I was always working around there when I was growing up um, and I never saw trails in the sky and I'm absolutely I was always when I started to look into chemtrails I was absolutely convinced I knew that these were new and unusual and strange and I'd even wondered why I hadn't noticed them before but I did start to research them and I started to video them started to post them to YouTube and I got a lot of feedback from people they liked my videos, and um, I just happened to live in an area where there's a lot of uh, uh, chemtrailing going on. And um, when I was researching the information, um, I seemed to be sharing information that people resonated with, and they felt that I, I was steering away from the disinformation and really cutting to the chase and being fortunate enough to find information that seemed very relevant. And uh, I started to get a following, so that's how I ended up becoming an activist, because I think once you start to realise how real this is and that you lose all the doubt, um, you, you realise you have to do something because when you delve, delve into this, you realise that the government are involved and you can't turn to them for help. So you kind of, well, as you delve into the community, you start realising that, that um, you need to raise awareness. That's, that's it ultimately in a nutshell. So that's, that's how I've got involved. Okay, I mean, that's quite logical progression to get to that point, yeah. Um, now, can we go, you did mention Project Woodpecker, so I just wanted to go back to that because I, I'm not sure if you're aware of, of the connection between a scientist, uh, I'm just going to read something out here, original research concerning the electron-cyclotron resonance heating method was done by Nicola 
Tesla and later expanded upon by not only Soviet scientists but also by US scientists such as Bernard J. Eastland, so scientists who happens mm-hmm. to be associated with ARCO, the Atlantic Richfield Oil Company. Now, the reason I brought that up is because ARCO, we had a conversation off air um, about like secret societies and whatnot, and it triggered my memory about that. And ARCO has traditionally been controlled, but apparently by members of the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, and I, in particular, remember you saying something about the Knights of Malta in relation to that, maybe a bit well, it, um, a lot of people um, who have been researching the Council on Foreign Relations have suggested that it's it's run by the Knights of Malta, and that the um, the Council on Foreign Relations basically they make all the policy, the foreign policy, they make policy for the United States um, government, and even um, I think I've posted a video of Hillary Clinton talking about how the CFR, the Council on Foreign, foreign Relations actually write all the policy and that she was so glad that they built a new office um, down in uh, in Washington so that they didn't have so far to go when they were doing something wrong. So, um, yeah, I think they're very, very closely related um, uh, with with Kim Charles, with, with Harp, yeah. with um, the whole uh, massive program that's going right. on. Nothing goes yeah. on in the United States about the Council of Foreign Relations having a significant role in it. Okay. Before we really go into what HARP is and all that kind of stuff, I'd like to speak to you about chemtrails. Now, can you tell us what are contrails and what are chemtrails and explain the difference between the two, um, how people can tell them apart? Yeah, well, um, basically, uh, a contrail is um, something that's formed behind an aeroplane um, at specific uh, conditions. It usually has to be above um, 30,000 feet, or uh, I think that's about 10,000 metres, or 8,000 8, uh, metres, um, which basically what it means is it has to be pretty high altitude. Not every plane can make one of these, and the temperature has to be below minus 35 degrees Celsius, and um, the humidity also has to be um, fairly uh, the right conditions. So it basically, to form a contrail, it has to be quite. It's quite specific conditions, and they're they're actually quite rare. Now, um, if you imagine on a on basically, it's condensation. It's the hot exhaust hitting very cold atmosphere and turning the the, uh, the ice crystals. It changes them so that you actually see it. But it should return to normal in a very short period of time. It's pretty much like breathing out on a very cold day. And you'll get your your breath coming out as a condensation trail, but it disappears afterwards because you, you've stopped talking yeah. or moved away or whatever. So it's pretty much like a, once the plane's left that immediate area because it's traveling forward, uh, the the atmospheric conditions return to normal. So it shouldn't persist, you know, because the heat source all gone. It's all gone. So it just returns back to normal. Um, and that's what we always used to see. And uh, funny enough, I was just talking to a pilot earlier on, just before I talked to you, and she was very concerned about Kim Trails, and uh, she was explaining that she's been flying since she was nineteen uh, since 1973, and uh, um, you know that that she's now very concerned about it because she clearly knows the difference between what a contrail is and what a chemtrail is. Now, a chemtrail is um, it initially looks like a contrail because it's coming out of the back of the plane. But it can be very, very long, and it can actually be, be sort of thicker and um, more brilliantly coloured. You can notice the difference, but mostly it's the length, really, that will catch um, once, once you become aware of what a chemtrail is. It's how long they are, and sometimes they're just switched on and off, and you can see that if you're watching the plane. And um, sometimes they form specific shapes in the sky, like X's. You'll notice there's a great big X in the sky or different grids in the sky. And we never yeah. used to see these massive visual um, statements in the sky before. Looks out of place, doesn't it? Yeah, it's quite quite disturbing. Now, uh, actually, my friend Dan Badondi, I've actually had him on here before, um, but he's a pilot um, and he, he knows like lots of other pilots obviously and like military pilots and whatnot he spoke to them about all of this um and they they back up what he says 
you know, like they totally he totally believes in chemtrails and they believe in chemtrails and so as far as I'm concerned, there's no doubt in my mind that chemtrails definitely exist. I mean, people all need all people need to do is, as you've said, just open their eyes, look up at the sky. You know, there's so much evidence out there. There's patents and whatnot. Anyway, I, before we go into all of that, obviously, uh, I want to ask you what kind of things, what kind of chemicals are in these chemtrails or are being used for the chemtrails? So you aware of? Okay, well, um, I think most people, when they start looking into chemtrails, at some point they will come across um, the various list of patents, and one of them is the, the Wellsbacks patent, and that is a specifically is specifically tailor made for geoengineering. And when you look into geoengineering, you will come across a documentary called What in the World Are They Spraying or Why in the World Are They Spraying? Now, these guys in the first one, What in the World Are They Spraying? They will talk about uh, what my in the sprays and so they look at the patents and they identify what they say they were using the patents and they talk about aluminium oxide they talk about barium salts and they talk about strontium and uh, there are various other metals as um, magnesium titanium iron copper zinc arsenic cadmium chromium there are many many different um, heavy metals and thorium and um, with different uses so basically when you, when you start looking into this, you start thinking, well, what can I do to find out if this is true? So what I did personally was take um, a sample of rainwater and have it analysed at my local government laboratory, which I've actually um, I've since had um, other tests done at different independent laboratories. But actually, it did it seem to be a legitimate sample. And so... You know, basically, we're coming back with excessively high amounts of aluminium, barium, strontium, um, arsenic, cadmium, chromium, and you know, this confirms the, these norm, these levels. When you start looking at different um, the normal levels, you realise they're excessively high. You know, really ridiculously high. In some cases, yeah. thousands of times higher than they should be. Yes, and at so these levels, they're very, very to- toxic. There's a lot of evidence out there, as you're saying, um, about the, these uh, chemtrails being in existence. Now, there's been attempts to defend the geoengineering agenda of chemtrail spraying by stating that the chemtrails form a reflective shield against global warming. What would be your take on this? Well, I've looked into, um, uh, obviously, you will end up, if you start becoming interested in chemtrails and want to find out about geoengineering, you will eventually come across that geoengineering is um, a program that they've been researching to possibly counteract global warming. Now, global warming, um, when, I, when I started to look into this, I remembered uh, the various little books that you would get in um, in W. H. Smith's at the counter. There would be some My Little Earth book or whatever, and there were all these different little books pumped out to try and tell us about what danger we were living in. And I remembered the uh, 1992 Earth Summit and basically how there was this huge problem about global warming. Now, as you start to look into it, you start to realise it's a fraud and that basically the Earth will go through cycles of change just like every other planet in our solar system and basically if we look at our recent history it's it's um it's quite easy to verify that um for example the vikings were growing barley in greenland up until the 13th century now there's no way that could be done now but there was a mini ice age in in the um, middle ages and that's why the Vikings actually started to go and expand anyway, because they had to, because they lived in, uh, in the, northern, the northern part of the northern hemisphere, and it was far too cold to carry on surviving. So basically there's evidence that the climate goes through changes, and it's got nothing to do with the anthropogenic uh, activities of man. We're not, we're not changing the environment. The planet is going through changes anyway. And if now when scientists look at the activity of the sun – and we can see changes going on in our planet. We can also see changes going on in other planets within our solar system as well. So there's absolutely no um, water that, that this this whole idea that um, our planet 
is changing because of our activity. I think we can all resonate with the idea that there's lots of toxins going into the environment and there's, there's lots of effects we are having. Yeah, of course, I don't deny that. But I don't believe that the significant changes they're trying to frighten everyone with, it's all about fear, is, are, are significant and real. And I think that science is now proving that. And we've also had um, the Climate Gate scandal at the university, at the, at the UK Climate Research Centre at the University of East Anglia. Um, their, their accounts, their emails were hacked and it was exposed that, that for many years they had been skewing the data and trying to make the data fit a model that suited the global warming hoax. So, you know, it's, it's, they don't even talk, the government doesn't even talk about global warming in that same way now. They talk, talk about it as gl- uh, climate change. So they're starting to change the tactics, but they've obviously got, uh, invested a lot in this program and carrying on with it. But there's no way that um, global warming is true. And in, in fact, if you start to research it a little bit, you will find that you'll come across um, the Club of Rome, which is an NGO it's a non-government organisation that basically um, was given the task to come up with a unifying um, problem that would bring all the world's governments together. And there, I've got, I haven't got a quote of it right now, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but basically they said um, that the activities of, of man on this planet was a threat to the planet and there are limited resources and we're using too much resources and the way that we're, we're operating is causing problem and we're responsible for global warming. And, and, and it's, it's just a made-up plan it's because there's a much bigger agenda. And uh, basically geoengineering is their program to combat this supposed global warming, but that's not the real reason at all. Yeah. So let's go back. And you did mention a little about the tests and that you've done. Can we go into a bit more detail about kind of tests that you've done, what kind of tests you've done to uh, find evidence of the chemtrail spraying? And um, can you also tell us what other tests you might be aware of that you might not have tried or um, well, and what um, you found it, from them, what, what kind of yeah. results you were finding? Well, I'll give you an example of how much higher than normal. Um, well, if, if you have to understand that aluminium uh, in the air, even in an in industrial urban area, should only be 0.008 micrograms per litre. Now, that's quite a small amount because aluminium shouldn't be in the atmosphere. But um, with this laboratory test here, which is a legitimate um, result is 740 micrograms per litre. Now, if if you multiply 0.008 into 740, you'll see how many times above normal it actually is. It's huge. But to give you an idea of whether or not that's a danger to your health, um, when you um, start researching geoengineering, you will come across um, some, some professors one called um, David Keith and the other one called Ken Caldera. And I think there are some others, but they're, they're the ones that sort of take the limelight and do the tours and try to raise um, support for geoengineering. Now, um, they've been questioned as to uh, the possible health impacts and the environmental impacts of spraying so many um, megatons of aluminium into the atmosphere along with the other ingredients. And they... Uh, have said that they have not done any research into the um, health impacts. And they categorically state that. They, they make sure that they, they point out they do not know. They say they, they don't know about the health impacts of spraying that much aluminium. Now, I know that's a lie because I have a document from the Wrights-Patterson Air Force Laboratory, and um, that's in the US, and um, it's a research lab. Can we from get the US link? Air Force? Do you, and that's, do you actually have a website link for that that we can maybe put? Like, actually, on my WordPress, I think the last the blog, um, the last blog that I put up there, um, on mrmaxbliss.wordpress.com, um, I've got a reference to right. the um, the, uh, the document itself, which you can print out. And basically, in this document, it it says that just five micrograms of aluminium 
is sufficient to damage uh, the alveoli, to damage the normal function of, of your lungs, basically, and impair your immune system. So basically, as you breathe in a very small amount, like five micrograms is, is very small, but the normal amount is 0.008 per litre. So um, when, when you get a rainwater analysis at 740, you know that there are serious health impacts. So you only have to start looking for the increases of um, respiratory illnesses. Um, like, for, for example, um, lung cancer has risen dramatically. And one of the key um, stimulants for the lung cancer so is cadmium, which in its aerosol form is very carcinogenic. Now, that's, that's also um, much higher than normal. But um, aluminium is linked to Alzheimer's, and I think most people will realize that Alzheimer's is, has increased a great deal. Many people are getting that now um, compared to the past. And there are many, many illnesses, actually, that are linked to what they are spraying or what we're finding in rainfall. Now, the, the significance of finding it in the rainfall means that, that these, these ingredients – can only get there at the point of nucleation at, during the process of precipitation. So it's up there in the atmosphere and it shouldn't be there. So, you know, the fact that they've done so much research on geoengineering and, um, and other um, research into other weather modification and to weather weaponry, um, basically, um, it's quite clear that we can find all these documents. It's quite clear there's a lot of research done into this, and the fact that we're finding it and the fact we can see all these strange things going on in the sky we never saw before, I think it's quite e easy to start to realise it's actually happening. And I, I have actually um, found a report in the Daily Mail about hailstones being um, having viruses and bacteria in them. Now, when you, when you think about it, the viruses and bacteria shouldn't be up there at the, at the point of uh, nucleation for, for hailstones. It's usually much higher. That's why they're, they can, with hailstones, it, it really has, the ice process has to go um, at quite a high altitude. So the fact that you've got viruses and bacteria up there, which has been proved not just from the Daily Mail's article, but on many other scientific journals and other articles, um, there are things in our atmosphere that just should not be there at that altitude. Absolutely. So how are they getting there? Yeah. Um, there's also, I mean, there's a, people are having complaints of like breathing problems. There's an increase in breathing issues and people getting more gallons. Well, more gallons, so. that is... When, actually, I didn't address your question properly. When you asked me what tests I would like to have done, um, mm -hmm. I would really like to have um, – I tried to get my blood tested, and um, I, you won't believe what difficulties I had trying to get my blood tested for heavy metals. And it even got to the stage where I had um, three samples taken because um, th th that's what they require, three different samples. And I sent them off to an independent laboratory in Germany and um, – through some sort of complicated problems with mix-ups and everything else, um, we had a few phone calls and couldn't understand why. The following uh, couple of days later, we were expecting the results and actually they just sent my blood back and they didn't want to do the tests. So I, I would like to get that tested because other people have had it tested and found that their blood is spiking and everything else. Some people get their hair tested and a lot of people have had this done and showing extremely high amounts of heavy metals. But as far as Morgellons is concerned, I would like to have my blood tested um, for nanotechnology because um, there have been many scientists now that are researching into Morgellons and they are finding out um, – see, the thing is – when you research into chemtrails, you find out that there's quite a lot of uh, information about smart dust and um, technologies called MEMS and GEMS, which are talked about for weather communication, for basically what they want to do is put these tiny little nanotechnology particles into the atmosphere. Now, you can have 30,000 of these on the head of a pin. These are minute, almost atomic-level nanotechnology devices. That's very, very disturbing. <laughs> Well, the, the thing is, they talked about this um, in the 90s. This isn't even new yeah. technology. This, so oh, yeah. they've, they've been thinking about this for a long time. Now, I'll give you a quick little hint, um, but, you know, I'm, I'm not saying they are doing it, but here's, here's, here's a link I found by accident that General Electric, um, they make 
Um, they've just merged recently with Hitachi Electronics, which is a major, massive electronics company. They now they make um, airplane engines. They also make smart meters, which are something we might touch on later. And they also make smart dust. Now, smart dust is the nanotechnology that uh, they talked about in the 1990s, uh, which are MEMS and GEMS, which are these tiny little nanotechnology that basically communicate with each other and create a grid in the atmosphere. So, you know, there's one company there that, that makes the whole lot. Um, and, you know, I think they might be linked, but I'm not saying they definitely are, but it's uh, certainly an interesting uh, connection. Um, but smart dust is very real. It's... Um, it's, nanotechnology has been around for a lot longer than many people realise. It's been around for 50 years. In fact, it's the same as with Harp. And like you touched on earlier on, Nikola Tesla, um, he was the, um, the, the main um, inventor of Harp. And, uh, that, and he died towards the end of the Second World War. And um, when he died, um, a lot of his uh, information was destroyed. And he had over 700 patents that hadn't been... Um, explored and they were confiscated by the CIA or by not the CIA because they didn't exist then but by the, the US Secret Service or whatever it was at that time and um, basically uh, Tesla had before he died realised about the implications of his inventions or his, his uh, patents and he had sent some of that technology to different nations so that no one nation would have that technology in one go supposedly but um it's, it's quite amazing that this technology, it appears, nanotechnology, it all appears to be new, but it's not new at all. Absolutely. Um, the military are apparently ahead of, ahead of us by decades. Um, um, and like the, what they've released to the public um, with their technology. But can we, like, from the results of these tests that you've developed, um, Chem busters, right? So, can we maybe talk about them? Oh, yeah. About what the what the chem busters, uh, what they're doing, like how how do they actually work? Okay, well, well, basically, I think as 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 my journey down the chemtrail route uh, continued, uh, and I became utterly convinced of the reality of the situation. You know, um, you go through lots of different em uh, emotions. You can get quite depressed. You can get quite sad. You can get quite angry. You can get – it's quite frightening. You know, you, you go through all these different things. And I wanted to do something. I wanted to – I didn't want to feel powerless. I didn't want to feel like I was living in fear. And I wanted to become more positive and more, more proactive about doing something. So I started to research what could we do. And I came across something about um, chem busters. And basically um, – um, the more, more I looked into it, it, it seemed a little bit of a leap of faith for me. It seemed like backyard science. It seemed a bit like, um, you know, some mad inventor making something and could it really work? And um, I came across this site about uh, the Orgon uh, Laboratory or something like that. And because Orgon is an energy and it's linked to combusters. And basically, um, when I was reading this um, Orgon Laboratory site, at the end of the site, it, it talked about chembusters and saying that chembusters are dangerous and you, if you had one, you should try to destroy it or bury it in the ground. And at that point, I realised I really must make one because um, they're trying to hide something. I'd come across so much disinformation on the internet before, so many different, you know, I'd learned to filter out disinformation. So I really thought, okay, I'll give this a go. And basically, um, you can find the instructions on the web quite quite easily, actually. There's look, quite a few people made them now, and there's lots of videos. Um, I've made four of them. And basically, what it is, is um, a resin um, metal base. You have metal shavings of different types of metals mixed together with liquid resin, and it sets, and you've got like um, a bucket mould. But in set inside uh, the resin um, is... Um, metal tubes and in the bottom of the metal tubes you've got double terminated crystals um, of quartz and um, they have a positive and a negative side the positive is the clearer side of the two points and uh, the positive side is pointing up and you glue those in the bottom of the pipes and uh, they're fixed in place 
And um, once it's all gone off, and um, it take, takes a, a few a few sessions because you can only do so much resin at a time because it gets too hot. So basically, you do one layer, and um, the pipes are parallel, vertical. And um, once it's all done, uh, you add the the additional lengths of the pipe. So in the end, it's about two meters high, and um, you've got a, a heavyweight base made of um, resin and, and metal fibers. Um, and these these six pipes, copper pipes I've got, but you can use any metal pipes, um, with the double terminate crystals. And what that, what happens is is that um, all those metal fibres are uh, held in the resin. They get excited and the electrons are all uh, interacting and they're creating energy. And basically the crystals, which uh, and crystals are used in computers, in watches, and you know they're recognised by industry. This isn't, you know, this is a legitimate tool to be using uh, our um, uh, material and basically the chemtrails when they're sprayed into the atmosphere they seem to be they, they appear to be negatively charged and basically um, the whatever happens I can't explain the actual science because I don't truly understand the science but I know how it works because I watch it working basically they disrupt the chemtrails I've heard it said that they take down the negative energy and replace it with positive energy. Now, it kind of makes sense, but when you see it, it totally makes sense. You know, I don't, I don't, I can't truly explain from a physics science point of view how it works, but I've seen it working. <laughs> I see it working all the time. Um, so, so when I first did this, I was like, I was uh, completely. Uh, amazed really and we felt um absolutely fantastic as well because the energy coming out of them is a uh, very positive energy organ energy is a real energy that you can measure it's not often talked about in science um but it is a real energy and um it makes you feel good do you remember like i think it's maybe a couple of years ago or something um there was a lot of incidents might not even be as long as that there was a lot of incidences um, been reported uh, very strange occurrences of birds just falling from the sky dead um, still happens now actually it, yeah yeah um, they were, when they, in Australia one specific case when they were given these birds when they were given an autopsy they were found the bodies were found to be full of heavy metal and lead now how does a bird that eats nectar out of wild flowers get heavy metal and lead in their body well, okay, that's going to lead us to um, what's happening with our soil and what's happening with our environment. Um, basically, of course, they keep on spraying these heavy metals into the environment. They have an accumulative effect on the soil. And the soils are changing and the plants are changing. Now, what, what's happening is they're getting a build-up of these heavy metals and um, slowly but surely the environment is changing. And as a response to that problem... You've got companies like DuPont and Monsanto and various other big... Um, Series. Yeah, they, they, they are making aluminium-resistant seeds. Now, there's no need to make any, anything aluminium-resistant because aluminium is actually a very abundant metal in nature, but it's in a safe form. You know, it's, it's, it, aluminium is, is one of those materials. You can't destroy it. If you change it, it will alter into something else because it will lock on to something else. But it's in a safe form. But if you, if you do nanoparticles, that's a different story, you know, because it's really at a, almost an atomic level. So uh, when we've got these huge amounts of aluminium being sprayed into the atmosphere, it is changing the soil, which easily anyone can test this with a normal pH kit, and you will find that some people who grow food will be complaining that they're not um, getting as much from their food as they used to. Many people I've talked to, and in fact, um, I had a gardener from America contact me recently about chemtrails because um, he, he has a massive audience of people. He's got TV thing, and he's concerned about chemtrails because things are not growing as well as they should be. And the problem is, well... What happens is the pH changes and then the, the normal foods cannot take up the nutrients they need to survive and they start getting diseases and fungals and bacteria. And so it, it's showing already. There's also another problem with forest fires. Um, you've probably been aware that um, 
basically since about 2000, we keep on hearing in the news year after year about various forest fires that are so intense and difficult to control all around the world, like in Greece or in California or in um, Australia or different locations. And this, it, they're far more intense and more um, aggressive than, than before. And that's because the nanoparticles of aluminium, aluminium is actually an accelerant and it's used in rocket fuel and it's, it was used in early uh, trials for fuel for jets. And so they, it's basically, it's very combustible. So these trees are breathing in or soaking up this aluminium from the soils and it's, and it's getting into the trees. And when there is a fire, it, it becomes far more intense. So this is, you know, there's lots of evidence to prove that this is happening. Yeah. With the soil being polluted with the, like the, and the, the genetically modified, the modifying process and um, obviously with the chemtrails if they're being sprayed everywhere and all, all that's like polluting the soil so like um, and the flowers that are ever growing out the soil then that could make a lot of sense about why the, a lot of bees are dying off oh, well um, we've lost 50% of the bees worldwide and in some places it's even higher and, and um, to give you an idea I, I'm not saying it's definitely them but there's a reaction and there's a solution. And Monsanto have bought um, the leading um, comp- uh, a bee research company so that they can make GMO bees. Um, now, some people say that's a reaction because they're trying to say that it's yeah. their Roundup or their pesticides or whatever. Um, but, you know, they're, they're definitely uh, intrinsically linked with spraying because we know that Monsanto... Um, made, manufactured the uh, Agent Orange that was used in Vietnam. Um, um, and actually, there were many different sprays they used in Vietnam. And um, Monsanto made those. So we know that they are at least have a history of it. So we're quite certain they're making um, aluminium resistant GMO seeds. And the seed line is not just for food, it's even for trees. So it's, you know, it's, qu- it's quite wide. So if they're genetically modifying bees. We know that bees are essential for uh, the supply of food in the world. They they propagate seventy uh, percent of all food stuffs in the world. So, you know, um, food's going to get pretty ordinary if they destroy the bee cop- uh, population. Yeah, what a horrifying thought, really, for humanity. If the bees go, then we only have a few more years, basically. Now. What's the legal situation regarding chemtrails? What kind of legislation are you aware of as regards them? Well, um, uh, I I am aware of uh, treaties like the Open Skies Treaties where military planes are allowed to fly in other countries' airspace, Um, but that's usually for uh, reconnaissance purposes. Uh, There is actually a treaty to say you are allowed to fly over our airspace if you're just taking photographs. Um, but there are, um, there was um, a treaty. Oh, um, there are, there is another treaty that says that you're not allowed to modify the weather for weapons. Um, but I mean, relative to geoengineering, the UK um, themselves uh, recently, uh, well, not recently, even in 2009, stroke 10. Um, they did their fifth report, which is 140 page long, on the regulations on geoengineering. That's from the Science and Technology Committee. Um, and this is an in-depth study. Now, remember, it's the fifth report. These reports are quite complex and they take a while to put together. So they've known about this for a long time, they've been considering it for a long time. And um, basically, in that, in that 140 page document, when you start to read uh, the summary right at the beginning, um, one of the... the The paragraph there says that um, the UN is the route by uh, which they see the regulatory framework being put into place. But the UK government um, must take the initiative to push the agenda of geoengineering up the international agenda. Um, So basically, um, the British government is very proactive about trying to create laws for geoengineering. And um, to give you an idea about that, you can go to www.srmgr. 
www.solarradiationmanagement.ai.org. And what that is, is a government site that's been set up. It's called the Solar Radiation Management Government Initiative. Because solar radiation is one of the methods of geoengineering, and that's spraying the particles into the atmosphere that will supposedly reflect the sun away to save us all from being fried alive. Um, okay, and- thanks. I am, I'm sorry to cut you short there. I'm right. conscious of how fast this interview is going, and I've still got a bunch of things I want to ask you. So, okay. can we move swiftly on to HARP? So, could you mm-hmm. maybe tell us what HARP is? What does it stand for? Um, and what what is the, uh, the capabilities of HARP and what do you think their main goals are behind using this technology? Um, well, um, HARP stands for the High Active Aurora Research Programme. And basically what that is, is using Tesla technology. Um, it's, it's about um, using different frequencies in the atmosphere to... Um, have different effects in the atmosphere. It's it's about it's dif- different reasons why they use HARP. Why they they publicise it? It's a civilian stroke military operation. Initially, it's it's funded by the military. It's it's funded for communication purposes. They're basically, you can see around the horizon because you bounce your signal off the ionosphere. The ionosphere is the upper atmosphere. It's the last part of our atmosphere. It's um, about. Uh, 300 miles up it's um it's an electromagnetic shield that's generated by the earth that protects us from the solar radiation now what they what they intended to do was to bounce a signal off the ionosphere and then bounce that around um over the curvature of the earth so that you could uh, communicate anywhere on the planet basically now um, with harp you can um, send extremely low frequencies through the ground so you could search for um, oil gas nuclear weapons bunkers under the ground or whatever reason that they give that they want to do that Um, they can communicate with submarines Um, they can interfere with the climate they can, and this is, is this is stipulated. I mean, I'll give you an example of what we can say without a doubt, because I've got a document here from the European Union. Now, the, U, the EU Parliament voiced its concerns about HARP in 1999. Well, they did 19 or um, yeah, 1999, and basically um, they were concerned because HARP can be used um, as a weapon to create earthquakes to create um, volcanic eruptions. They can use it for mind control, or they call it altering human behavior. Um, They can create um, a drought region. They can deny a country rain, or they can flood a country with too much rain. Um, They can create hurricanes, and they can steer hurricanes. I mean, the U.S. have done that since 1947. They did... um, uh, they did a, a, um, a program called um, Operation Storm Fury, which was a 20-year uh, program on how to steer hurricanes. Um, so basically, they can create earthquakes, they can do volcanic eruptions, tectonic uh, things, they can create tsunamis, they can um, create drought regions, they can create flood regions, they can create hurricanes, they can create tornadoes, um, they can do mind control, which they call altering human behavior. They can actually triangulate... Um, different installations and create something called a particle beam which can de- destroy things and when I say destroy things I mean more destructive than a nuclear weapon um, basically that's part of the Star Wars program so the idea was that a missile could be coming in and they could destroy it um, they can alter um, space weather but, um, by creating holes in the ionosphere that's one of the bad side effects about using HARP is that there now are multiple holes in the ionosphere. Now, the ionosphere is our protective shield against radiation. Now, that radiation, without that shield, we would all die. So they are burning holes into the ionosphere and, um, and basically putting us all at risk so they can continue with their experiment or their weapons program. Another thing they can do is by putting up a tremendous amount of energy. We're talking 5.1 gigawatts, right? Now, if you think about that um, that film with um, 
Back to the Future, whatever it is, and you've got that guy, he's going, what, 1.2 and 21 gigawatts, whatever it is. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a fraction, it's a quarter of what they're using to send up into the atmosphere. Now, when it gets up to the atmosphere, they can actually force multiply because the energy that's in the electromagnetic shield that is the ionosphere is much greater. So they can tap into that, and then they can direct that to any location they want. So that's how you can, if you do that by triangulating, you can make a, a tremendous amount of power. It's like harnessing lightning. So this is, this is how dangerous HARP is. It's, it's basically the ultimate weapon. That's disturbing, um, which I, I seem to be keeping seeing. It's just a thread of the, the whole topic we're covering tonight. There's just a lot of kind of very... Um, and this, the, the, this can be verified, so. you know. You, this, this, yeah. this, this, if all the information I have gleaned, like I'd just like to reiterate that I am no more an expert than any other person. I don't claim to be. I'm just a concerned person that's done the research, and the research is there for everyone to find. You know, it's it's oh. it's not top secret information. It, it's it's that you can glean this stuff from the internet. Admittedly, some of this stuff comes from the European Parliament. And some of this stuff comes from military um, um, sites that are publicly available. You can find this stuff. You just right. have to do I'm, a lot of searching. I'm conscious that we've only got a few minutes left, so I just want to rapidly cut out a few questions I was going to ask you and move to the, the, the key ones. Like, for example, you're very active in campaigning against chemtrails, as we are aware here. Um, You've recently just finished a chemtrail awareness tour um, in your truck up in van, I believe, with a bunch of people. Um, do you want to tell us a bit about that? Um, what what you've done, um, where you went, um, how how was it all received and, and any other activism or you've been a, a part of or planning in the future and maybe tell us how people can get involved as well? Yeah, well, that's right, because, well, one of the things that we, we've we all gone through these different processes of feeling sad, angry, depressed, and everything else, and it is bad, you know, I've had my head and my my hand is crying, my eyes out sometimes, but at the end of the day, you have to pull yourself together and realise, well, you know, I, I really want to do something. So when I was making all my videos, I seemed to get quite a following on YouTube, which is which is pretty good. In in At that time, within six months, I had over 3,000 subscribers and, you know, hundreds of thousands of video views. And um, because of that, um, a really passionate woman who's uh, so, so filled with um, energy, her name is Mona Norman, um, she contacted me and asked me, uh, she said she was putting on a conference in London uh, about chemtrails and would I be happy to come and give a presentation. And I'd never done anything like this before. Um, but at that time, I was actually getting quite frustrated just making videos and sharing information commenting whilst I was making the videos and I kind of felt like I'd, I'd reached my my limit of what I could do there so it was a great opportunity for me to do this conference so I went to London and I, uh, by, before I'd done this I'd already decided to paint up my van now I've got an LDV convoy long wheelbase van that's an old post office van and basically I painted it on every available surface um, with different um, signs and information and groups because I belong to lots of different groups all around the world and so there's lots lots of different names of groups and stuff like that which gives people an opportunity to see that this is a worldwide concern because there are literally groups and hundreds of groups all around the world and um, they could see the big messages about chemtrails, stopping chemtrails and it, it gives people an opportunity to ask me questions so I drove over to London in the, chem in the chug -a boom which we call it and uh, the conference was absolutely wonderful. Following the conference, um, I met a guy called um, Terry Lawton, who's a long-term activist, and um, he's from Ireland, and uh, he, he was part of the um, Girl Against Fluoride campaign. And uh, he's very interested in chemtrails. And um, we got talking, and we decided to go out into the streets of London the following day, and we started handing out flyers, and it was pretty good. It was good to... to um, reach people that had not really come across this before and actually get information out. We had some flyers from the conference. Um, so that was a great success. So following that, 
um, it was like, well, when are we going to do the next one? This was wonderful. It was very inspiring. We, we set up some groups with the people. There were, there were uh, quite a lot of people there, and a lot of people wanted to, to – they came from different parts of the country, and they wanted to set up their groups. So basically different groups got set up because of that conference, and um, we linked up people, and you can actually make contact with people rather than just using the internet. So following that, it was like, well, let, let's do another one. And it was like, well, I've got to come from France. And uh, Terry said he'd like to, to do a presentation as well. And he's coming from Ireland. So it's like, well, if we're going to make this journey, let's do more than one. Let's try and fit in another one. And then that developed into a, a tour. So we ended up doing six cities. So because we, these different groups are around, different people said, oh, well, can you come to our, our town and we'll get a venue and we'll, we'll set this up. So basically what happened was we arrived for the London um, GMO protest at Hyde Park and then following that we went to Maidstone then to Glastonbury Exeter um, to Stroud uh, Nailsworth Portsmouth and Brighton so we would go to different places and we went to the town hall at Glastonbury and we went to the um, Phoenix Centre in Exeter and, and different locations sometimes it was in a community centre another time it was in a pub but it was quite a big function room and um, basically we went out into the streets before and we uh, flyered as many people as we could. We parked up with a van. We got banners out. We got huge banners that are like um, a metre 50 high. And some of them are like eight metres wide of all the pictures of the different equipment that they use for spraying. Because we've got pictures of the tanks inside planes, uh, the chemical tanks, and connected with computers. And we've got pictures of the nozzles that they use for spraying. And basically, in a picture, you can see that they're spraying something. Um, so it was a very good way to actually reach just normal people in the, uh, the general public. Okay, so um, yeah, basically what we found was um, we were able to reach many, many people in the public. We've um, stimulated uh, the council. The council at uh, Glastonbury is starting up their own action group, and many other groups are being initiated because we went around raising awareness. And we basically took every opportunity we could. We got to speak on mainstream radio three times, and um, basically, uh, it was nothing but positivity. We've reached more people, and it's inspired us. So, you know, we want to do another tour, and um, we're in the process of um, so many people are requesting that we go to their town now. We're, we're trying to organize ourselves, and we will be going on another tour. Okay, thank you very much. Um, do you have any very final words? Uh, like just a final website to throw out very quickly just before I finish up well there's, there's Kim Charles Project UK and there is um, um, Skywatch UK or UK Skywatch actually UK Skywatch www.ukskywatch.co.uk or um, Kim Charles Project UK.com and um, they're, they're two good um, sites with lots of links and also I mean if you if you want to go to geoengineering.watch.org um, um, geoengineeringwatch.org or geoengineeringexposed.com. Um, um, I mean, I would say, well, obviously for the Britain, we'll, we'll stay with the British people. I mean, they're fantastic sites. Anyway, Kim Chow Project UK and, and UK Skywatch. Thank you very much um, for coming on the show, Max. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you on. I'd love to have you on again in the future, perhaps with the rest of uh, the people you're working with for this activism. Uh, also, if you want to stay on for the next hour, you're more than welcome. And so, and if if you do, then we can maybe pe open the phone lines. We usually open the phone lines anyway. It's a dark city show with a dark city cruise. It's a different format, obviously, but um, people might have questions they want to ask you. So it's entirely up to you. Well, I'll be happy if you know if anyone wants to ask any questions. We more excellent. Than happy to yeah. Excellent. So um, the phone lines will be open. And um, thanks everybody for listening. Tonight, you were listening to Don's Diorama. Over and out. Good night. They said we could not do it. They said it wasn't possible. But we did it. We created a free radio station to bring the people together and spread an alternative message from the mainstream. They tried to silence us. They tried to hack us. But we carried on. You cannot silence the truth. You cannot enslave freedom. You cannot stop a good idea. You cannot stop Dark City Radio. The crew is now bigger and stronger than ever before. We will not be kept off the airwaves. We will continue. 
This is not our radio. This is your radio. This is Dark City Radio. This is your Dark City. 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 This is your Dark City Radio. This is your Dark City Radio.